pledge $1,000. We are talking about a major push towards making sure that KPFA can get to its goal of its winter drive to, 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 to bring in as much money as we need so that we could keep this precious resource on the air. I'm hoping you can go to the phones right now, show that you support KPFA, show that you support shows like this, Letters uh, letters from Washington, the first hundred days, show that you know that it's important that during these critical times right now, I can't think of any other time uh, that could be more critical, this transition period and how it happens. Right now, if we're going to right this ship, we have to be right at the middle of it. We have to be talking to lawmakers. We are doing it, but now we need you to play your part by going to the phones and dialing 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-439-5732. Show that right now, KPFA is the right station at the right time. So important right now because you're not going to get a progressive analysis of what's going on in Washington anywhere else because the mainstream media basically they work within this paradigm of left and right Democrat and Republican. They're not going to give you a progressive perspective on what's happening in Washington. For them, the opposition is the Republican, the conservative perspective. That now has become the opposition. But you and I know that is not absolutely the truth, that there is wider spectrums out here and that we come through a value ba- uh, a value base that is based on equality, fairness, economic equality, economic justice, peace. This is what we're talking about. I have to go. Thank you for listening. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is two minutes past two o'clock. Stay tuned next for a special program continuing our fun drive. Stay tuned. Welcome to your own health and fitness. I'm health integrationist Lena Berman, and I come to you weekly with a critical, independent voice on the politics and practice of health. By now, you probably know that there's a lot of mercury in tuna and other large fish. At least I hope by now you know. But the story of how this fact came to light, at what peril, and how it got into the fish, ah, now there's a story. Do you think the mercury in your teeth is worth considering? Well, consider this. The organic mercury or methylmercury, which is what mercury turns into in organic tissue, is far more toxic. And this is the form in fish. Ironically, this form of mercury causes damage to the heart. Interesting, since the Heart Association and the fishing industries are pushing fish for heart health. Boy, is this confusing. So how did it get in there? Who's responsible and duplicitous in poisoning the oceans, its life, and ours? Join us as we dive below the murky issue of mercury toxicity so you can protect yourself and the planet. First, an editorial about this week's health news by Jeff Fawcett, Ph.D. Thank you, Lena. Economic times are bad and threaten to get worse. Illness and injury come with these hard times. A recent study in The Lancet reported that life expectancy in former communist countries decreased dramatically as privatization destroyed these societies' social fabric. The researchers found that where so-called social capital was high, that is, where community bonds were strong, the effect was much less. This seems obvious, but sometimes it's necessary to state the obvious. People live better and longer where they care for and about each other. Luckily, our predicament is not nearly as dire as those post-communist countries, but it's dire enough. Single-payer health care is not the answer. It's the beginning of an answer, and it's far from a solution. Or should I say, it's a small part of the solution. As I said before, it's criminal that we don't have such a system. For a brilliant proposal, I refer you to the recent study Medicare for All by the Institute for Health and Socioeconomic Policy, the research arm of the California Nurses Association and the National Nurses Organizing Committee. Their proposal argues for a 
medical care system that would cover everyone without charge for a total cost increase to our economy's medical care tab of 3%. However, the plan would also create 2.6 million jobs and additional tax revenues that would virtually eliminate the increased cost. This doesn't begin to count the economic benefits that would result from free universal medical care. What would those benefits be? To start with, greater productivity and less stress-related illness and injury. For me, this point is what should be the real conversation. Is a dollar better spent on research and practice for prevention or treatment? I realize that we need both, but I think some real comparisons should be made between what our nation and communities spend to prevent people from becoming sick or injured and what we spend treating people once once they're in need of care. Beyond that, I'd like to see a comparison of spending on research that identifies what puts us at risk with spending for research on treatments for those risks after they've taken their bite. Right now, what's spent for research and practice of prevention is dwarfed by what's spent on treatment. I'll give you an example. A recent study in the New England Journal of Medicine adds to the already substantial body of research showing that reductions in fine particulate air pollution have a significant effect on reducing the risk of illness and injury. This form of air pollution comes from fossil fuel combustion. So one way to look at the development of electric cars and renewable energy sources is that they'll have a huge effect in reducing medical costs for lung disease, heart disease, asthma, diabetes, and other diseases. So public spending on green technology is not only good for the economy's health, it's good for our personal health, and as a consequence, good for reducing the burden of medical care costs. There's a structural problem, of course. What gets spent on the research and practice of prevention is almost entirely a public expense. On the other hand, what gets spent on the research and practice of treatment is controlled directly and indirectly by private for-profit businesses. These include doctors, most hospitals, and insurance companies as well as pharmaceutical companies and medical device manufacturers. Daunting, but not dire. The forces of commerce work tirelessly to prevent change for better prevention. They also work tirelessly to prevent change for better treatment outside their own business interests. But times of crisis always provide opportunities for radical change and we have a great opportunity a national government that seems ready at least to listen to us is anxious to act and most importantly is putting organizing tools in our hands that can have powerful effects tools that can enable us to come together so that we're better able to care for and care about each other a transcript of this editorial is available at the blog on your own health and fitness dot, dot org i'm jeffrey fawcett Take care of yourself. Dr. Jeffrey Fawcett is an environmental uh, economist. He's a political economist, writer, and health educator who produces this show with me and is director of the Sustainable Health Institute. He is also a co-author with me of a book that's coming out soon called Too Much Medicine, Not Enough Health. Now to today's topics, which is Mercury Politics and my guest, Jane M. Hightower, MD, is a board-certified internal medicine a physician in San Francisco, California. She published a landmark study that brought the issue of mercury in seafood to national attention. She continues to publish scientific papers and give lectures on the subject. And we're very grateful that she took time out of her busy practice to talk to us today. Welcome to you. Thank you, Leah, for having me. Oh, such a pleasure. So, you've been quite the troublemaker, thank heaven. Despite the old guard warning you that you'll cause panic, what has the net effect of your research and disclosure been? Well, well, I think since we're in the information age, not much panics us anymore. <laughs> so uh, that's an old term that industry still uses to bully us. Um, but yes, uh, I had a lot of patients who uh, really love consuming fish. We in the Bay Area, actually it's a coastal problem more than an inland problem. Uh, and we do like our fish. Uh, but we have to choose wisely. The more fish we consume, we should choose uh, the lesser mercury fish, such as the small non-predators, uh, you know, sardines, anchovies, sole, even uh, wild salmon is a non-predatory short-lived fish. 
Yes, it's it's ironic that uh, upper middle class people can be so plagued by eating a food that's um, recommended, you know, very strongly recommended. So what sorts of things were you seeing in your population? What kinds of symptoms did you find that, you know, were sort of failure to thrive kind of things? Yes, uh, I think that what had happened is that so many people were coming in and you know, I'm a diagnostician that means I like to solve the riddles in, in internal medicine so people would come in with their numerous papers and workups and they were spending thousands of dollars on trying to find out why they were fatigued muscle and body aches uh, troubles thinking poor memory insomnia even tremor hair loss stomach upset and they just couldn't find a cause some people had the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. Some had diagnoses of chronic fatigue. Uh, and, you know, really it was by serendipity that uh, I and uh, Dr. Kathy Fields, my associate uh, or a colleague of mine, happened upon the mercury issue. And I started testing my patients and started doing, uh, conducting dietary histories. And sure enough, they all had a common link. So I wasn't sure if it was a mercury or something else in the fish. I had them stop consuming it, uh, and their mercury went down, and uh, nearly all of them had symptoms that uh, resolved uh, within a year. But uh, a few were still worried about, um, and some especially with the very high exposures, think they still have a reduction in their memory. Well, there are some neurological effects at high levels of mercury contamination. Um, now, what you discovered is that the where to look for this was in these patients' blood rather than hair or, or urine or something else, that it had to be in blood. you want to explain why that's an important marker? Yes, uh, there's a few ways to test for mercury. And uh, number one, we can't really know how much total mercury is in one's body because uh, you know, your body takes it up like a sponge, and different organs have different half-lives. So you may have a low blood level, but you're still retaining it to some degree in your liver and skeletal muscle and heart tissue and brain. And once it gets demethylated, you know, the methyl comes off, that organic part comes off the mercury in the brain, then the half-life of the remainder of the mercury is measured in years. So you want to not accumulate. So when... Physicians looked at mercury in the past. We always thought of occupational exposures, and that usually was an inorganic mercury that readily went through the urinary tract. So a lot of physicians would check a 24-hour urine for mercury, and you're really not seeing it there. Methyl mercury goes through uh, the other pathway in the stool or feces. Therefore, you're not going to see it in the urine. So we're really missing the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So there, the two ways that I test is either the blood, where you have sort of a spot check of, of mercury, uh, and the other way is to use hair because it's so strongly bound into the hair, uh, you can use it forensically. Uh, you know, it, it sticks into your hair like rings on a tree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I see these people in my practice as well, people who have been to everybody, you know, who have these uh, odd symptoms, including the hair loss, which is really interesting, and the cognitive and stuff, which could be so many other things. It could be thyroid. It could be all these other things. So um, one of the things that happens to these patients is that they sort of fall, and I realize this is a strong word to use, pray to practitioners who uh, start them on very aggressive chelation programs um, and get them to take all the mercury out of their teeth. And what's wonderful about your story is that you kind of just thought this through very carefully and asked them to stop eating the fish and the, and the levels went down dramatically. So it's clear that although having mercury fillings may not be um, prudent, <laughs> and it, so if you can have them removed, if you can afford to have them removed and have it done in a way that doesn't recontaminate you, because you have to, it has to be very carefully done, um, that, uh, you know, the, the, the mercury fillings may not be the primary cause of the contamination. And you used a wonderful example of a bodybuilder who was eating all this fish. And of course, I went through, not of course, I went through a period myself of being a bodybuilder and did indeed eat a lot of fish. And um, my mercury levels did go up. So when I saw your research, when I heard you first on the air, uh, some some many several years back uh, i was very pleased that you had put that together instead of immediately subjecting people to treatments which may just release the mercury and have it bouncing around in their system so uh thank you so much for that 
Yes. Um, Did you want me to comment? You uh, may indeed do that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, number one, yes, uh, people do fall prey to uh, people who uh, might suggest other treatments. I had people come in with all kinds of various treatments for this problem. And I even removed magnets out of earlobes. People were desperate for a, a treatment. In fact, I still have the magnets in my desk just for a souvenir. And, uh, you know, they do fall prey. And, um, you know, a lot of times people would come in saying, well, it was discovered. They would actually have the mercury discovered. And they said, well, I had my amalgams removed. So that's, you know, thousands of dollars or at least a thousand. Oh, at least. Yeah, at least. And uh, then they said, well... Uh, I still had mercury, and mm -hmm. they would say, well, then what did you, I would ask them, well, then what did you do? They said, well, I got chelation, and I said, well, why are you still on chelation? She said, well, you know, there's, the mercury just doesn't leave the body. Mm -hmm. Well, and it I doesn't said, leave the body if your detoxification pathways don't work, and that's a nutrient well, deficiency. You know? Yeah, right. Well, here's the other issue. You know, yeah. DMSA and DMPS is very good for getting the mercury out, but, it, yes. but it's adding a poison to a poison, and yes. there's problems with it. So I don't suggest chelation. Uh, but um, the other issue, I always ask them, you know, when I saw these uh, uh, desperate folks, is that did anybody ever tell you to stop eating it? Mm -hmm. And they look at me dumbfounded. Mm -hmm. I said, no one ever said I was eating it. I'm eating it. Mm -hmm. So thousands of dollars later, all they had to do is a $20 test and look at a dietary history, and they could have avoided the whole thing. Um, I just want to remind people, you're listening to your own health and fitness. I'm Lena Berman uh, with Jeff Fawcett, PhD. I'm uh, on the phone with Jane M. Hightower, MD, who is a San Francisco physician who has done a very groundbreaking study. Her book is called Diagnosis, Mercury, Money, Politics, and Poison. Um, you know, one of the things that's... It, this book, I have to say, is like reading many other... Not, not that it's not distinctive in its style and, and its voice, but the story of mercury is so similar to so, so many other poisons in the environment. The story of there being a sort of allowable limit and how the levels change and who's testing and who's responsible, who's regulating and what's happening. Um, the specifics here is... Again, the allowable limit issue, it's like everywhere you went for help, even you, who is a well-known and, and uh, well-trained um, specialist, you know, physician with a specialty, still couldn't get the information. People didn't answer your calls. They didn't answer you directly. Uh, so the, the allowable limits kept changing. What you knew changed. And it's not clear who's even testing and, and fish or marine life. And anyway, let me let you take one of these at a time. Yes, um Number one, there is what's called an action level, and that's the amount of mercury allowed in the food or in the fish, and that's one microgram per gram. Then you have the amount in humans, which we think is uh, protective below a certain amount, and the EPA has the most strict and the National Research Council, and that's that you want to keep your blood mercury less than five or a hair level less than one, and that's five micrograms per liter or one microgram per gram. Uh, and then you have the dose that gets you there. And uh, that's where the wheels kind of fall off the cart because when you look at when the action level was originally made, and that's what I had to do is go back and find out where did it all start? How did we get this action level of one? Because it was previously held at 0.5. And what I discovered, um, and by the way, no one has ever in my experience with all the experts that I talked to, no one has ever really gone back and read the actual court case of the FDA versus Anderson Seafood Incorporated. No one's ever looked at that case themselves to know how this was derived. It wasn't derived with a group of scientists. It was derived by um, scientists, yes, but they were paid off by fishing industry. And they used data that occurred that, that came from a poisoning that occurred in Iraq in 1971-72 with a seed grain fungicide put on grain. And it was under the boss extremists with Saddam Hussein as vice president um, that that poisoning occurred. And I talk about it in the book because no one's ever really looked at it um, as whether it was truly an accident or truly malicious uh, because the Kurds seem to be overwhelmingly affected by this. And so that poisoning um, actually is what we base our standards for from the FDA. Uh, <laughs> well, the other thing that I would posit is, as as it is with lead, I think what we will find is there isn't really a safe allowable limit. 
Correct. Uh, there has never been a safe, allowable limit found for mercury. Uh, you know, it tickles our antibodies. Um, you know, there's a reason more than antisepsis uh, or a preservative effect why they put it in the vaccines. Uh, mercury works as a great adjuvant. It stimulates antibodies, making mm. the vaccine a little more effective. And making people be more predisposed to autoimmunity. Correct. Autoimmune uh, diseases. Yes, there's research, mm. uh, lots of research coming out that shows that mercury can stimulate autoantibodies. So the people who... Um, may want to think about, you know, uh, lowering the mercury to the lowest rumble possible um, and um, also uh, thinking about getting amalgams out are those who are predisposed to autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. And there's more and more uh, people like that out there. Um, what you've What you've kind of, the, the point in this conversation that you brought us to is how the mercury got where it is and one of the things you've just pointed to is the use of fungicides and um, various chemicals that have mercury in them and I don't think people even realize how many chemicals and other additives are out there and where they're getting it and everybody I think knows maybe not everyone I think this audience knows that coal burning in power plants uh, are sources of mercury in the environment they probably also by now are beginning to know that fluorescent lights when they're disposed of, have mercury that leaches into the environment. Um, they Correct. know about old thermometers. But there's other sources like Correct. medical stuff and Correct. pharmaceuticals. So why don't you go ahead? Yeah, um, you know, there are many sources of mercury. The number one still today is our coal-fired power plants. And there really isn't any such thing as uh, clean, clean coal, coal technology. Thank I mean, that, you. that's uh, something that was created by someone wanting to sell coal. Because you're still digging it up, and um, you know the local people look at what happened with Tennessee and the and uh, how the pollution from some of these mining operations pollute the community. So um, there's got to be a better way. And so mercury and uh, the coal is one. And then we used to use it for all the barometers and uh, instruments uh, in medicine. Then you have the amalgam issues. So it used to be hospital incinerators also was a big cause. And then cement factories, believe it or not, also are, are still uh, polluting in some areas. So uh, the EPA is getting a better handle on, on those polluters. And then there are the... Um, are the chloralkali plants, and there's still a few left, that are using mercury cells to uh, give us the uh, chloralkali in their prod other products. And I just recently was a co-author right. with Renee Dufault that showed that... Um, fructose. Yeah, the high fructose corn syrup industry is keeping those uh, mercury cell plants in business. And... So the mercury is getting into the food. It's not only getting into the high fructose corn syrup, which we demonstrated, but uh, on Agricultural Trade Policy uh, you know, uh, Institute, we also saw that it's getting into the food. So uh, people who are extra sensitive to this, you know, they should really uh, press the manufacturers to uh, take these things out. And then, of course, the thermo uh, th thimerosal in in um, as a preservative, in, right? The in preservatives in vaccines, uh, vaccines. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, it was only until 1998 that mercurochrome was uh, and other mercurials right. were taken off the market. That. Yeah, I still remember that stuff. And it w doesn't really work as a good antiseptic. Mm -hmm. One of the my infectious disease colleagues said, "Well, it worked very well as a paint." So that the guys uh, who are going to draw someone's blood use mercurochrome, it, it marked the area where they're not supposed to put their hands. <laughs> oh, great. Um, another interesting thing in this story is th th that I don't think people realize how much mercury damages the heart. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that these studies are kept very quiet while the industries are promoting fish as heart healthy. Correct. Um, with the, um, a lot of the studies that actually looked at omega-3s and mercury, uh, they showed that generally as your omega-3s go up at a certain point, and it's very low that it occurs, that it actually negates the good effects of omega-3 fatty acids, and it can actually increase risk of heart attack. And, uh, wait a minute. Of course wait, 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 wait. Um, are you, I want to unpack that because that's, uh, um, you're going to cause panic. 
Oh, no. You know, <laughs> no, no, but what you're, are you saying that there's a sort of dose-response curve with omega-3s, or are you saying that omega-3 fatty acids, if they've not been distilled and had the mercury removed, cause this? Okay, you told those are two different questions. Mm-hmm. When you talk about distilled, you're talking about the pills. And those generally are mercury free now, mm-hmm. and PCB and lead and arsenic yeah, free probably too, because mm-hmm. those are the pills are different. I'm talking mm-hmm. about the fish. Okay. So what we try to do in my practice is get uh, the omega three fatty acids without a, a significant amount of mercury, and we have to say, well, what is significant? Well, you have to at least keep it under five, if not under three uh, micrograms per liter. And what we found is, if you eat fish to where your mercury goes up then you're not going to get as much benefit from the omega-3 fatty acids, and you can actually increase your risk of heart attack. And that's being argued right now um, very bitterly because, you know, the fishing industry um, and their lobbyists give a lot of money to the American Heart Association. So the American Heart Association is in the food endorsement business. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why, Mm -hmm. for a long time, Starkist was the only um, visible... uh, tuna can uh, that had the heart healthy label from the American Heart Association. They pay exclusive um, rates to have that. Now, I know that their heart association uh, has really been uh, controversial on their food endorsement program because that brings in more conflicts of interest. Oh, yes. And and there's also no surprises in why there are studies available that make it look as though mercury is just fine it has to do with who does the studies how they're paid for it's the usual nonsense so this brings us to the subject of the uh the the two studies that that they love to to uh quote the uh say say, i i I had this right and now i'm saying it wrong say the, seychelles. Uh, seychelles that's right it's like seashells seashells by the seashells, and the seashells and the pharaoh's islands um these these this is worldwide there's a problem worldwide this is an example but the deception is even wider you know when you look at how these bad pieces of research you know uh, and the reporting and the and the um the deep pockets of the people who are paying for these studies so that they'll come out the way they should correct well the old saying of lies damn lies and statistics and uh you can see where some of the studies will put um let's say some of the group studies they've done this um in europe also that everybody screamed about is that they'll take a group of people uh who eat fish and they'll put maybe a, a one of the high fish high mercury fish in with the low mercury fish and where you'd cancel out that mercury effect. So they can they can fudge the data by the way they set up the whole study. And uh I don't know if I made myself clear, but they you don't always know exactly what the people are eating uh, as far as omega-3s and mercury uh, in some of these studies. And so I caution people when someone comes out that, you know, says, oh, you know, the benefits outweigh the risk, period, and you don't hear anything about mercury. I always question that, you know, how did they conduct the study? They didn't tease out uh, this issue. There's never been a blinded, placebo-controlled study published where you give methylmercury to humans. Uh, that would probably be unethical because we know it's neurotoxic, it causes harm. Yet you can go to the grocery store and eat all you want without signing a consent form. Um, but as far as the Seychelles and the pharaohs, uh, the pharaohs, uh, I could not find really any major conflicts of interest, and they showed uh, effects on permanent brain damage in children when they were exposed in utero and in small infants. The Seychelles... Uh, for a long time, always has said, no, we don't have any effects. We found none. Their latest said, okay, we had some effects, but it's not impacting our community. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> um, so uh, the Seychelles, though, one thing I found out was they run the second largest tuna cannery in the world, and their uh, GDP is very dependent on fishing industry. So, so the fishing industry is famous for saying it's like <laughs> there's, a, there's another cases of people drinking drinking certain things and saying, "See, this is perfectly safe." The fishing industry is eating its own product. Do they test people in the fishing industry to see? Yes, that's called the Seychelles study. Oh, that's the Seychelles. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the their Seychelles children study. because most people have some sort of 
there's there's only probably one degree of se- uh, separation at most with the fishing industry when they're looking at these children. They're going to be fishing industry related fish uh, related industries children. Uh, the government workers that are in charge of uh, examining the children also um, they receive their paycheck from the fishing industry because the government of Seychelles are, uh, owns 40% of that cannery. Uh, now it's very difficult to conduct a study where you're using the uh, people as study subjects who have an interest in the outcome, financial outcome of that study. And uh, the fishing industry has done this before, where they've taken uh, studies in American Samoa, who has the number one cannery, and they looked at Peru, who had the top swordfish industry, and they in the paper then declare that we used fishermen and their spouses as study subjects. And they continually say, well, no problem here. Mm. We've never had a headache. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, you know, this is, uh, well, actually, I see that we're getting very close to needing to take a brief musical break. This is Your Own Health and Fitness. I'm Lena Berman uh, with Jeff Fawcett, Ph.D. Today we are speaking by phone to Jane M. Hightower, M.D. Um, She's an internist who has done an extremely groundbreaking piece of research that has brought to light the issue of mercury in the environment. Her book is Diagnosis, Mercury, Money, Politics, and poison. We're going to take a very brief musical break, and when we come back, we'll continue with this conversation about the politics of Mercury. So stay with us. This is your own health and fitness. I'm Lena Berman, and I uh, just want to remind you there's information about your own health and fitness, our guests, our practice, a free stream of this week's show, CD copies, and lots more at yourownhealthandfitness.org. Our information number is 707-874-2772, and we are talking about the politics of mercury with Jane M. Hightower, MD. Her book is Diagnosis Mercury. Her website is uh, diagnosismercury.org or com? Dot com, I believe. Dot org. Dot org. Diagnosismercury.org. And um, as I said, we're discussing the politics of mercury. So um, there's, you know, th- there isn't a lot of good news as, as we've been un- uncovering here in this conversation. There isn't a lot of good news about the way the rest of the world is dealing with this problem. It isn't just. Uh, the U.S. and its capitalist interests. It's happening everywhere. For instance, Canada, I mean, we've already looked at Iraq. We've looked now here at uh, the Seychelles and the Faroes. Um, Canada uh, acted quickly when they had a problem, but there was absolutely no transparency. So there's a, a lot of information has been uh, covered covered up and whatnot. And then, and then their own people, the Ojibwe, uh, are at risk. So talk a little bit about Canada. Yes, uh when um, the guy by the name of Norvald Semright um, was doing his graduate studies uh, in the 60s, he discovered that these uh, mercury fungicides, number one, in Sweden were causing problems with the birds, uh, and, uh, and the fungicide was getting into the water. And uh, so Sweden actually banned that mercury fungicide. And um, so... He thought, well, there's other polluting causes when he started testing the water. And he went over to Canada and said there should be other waterways downstream from, like, chloralkali plants, paper and pulp mills that use fungicides and whatnot. There should be some pollution. And sure enough, major pollution. And uh, Dow Chemical was the one that uh, caused the biggest stir because it started with them up in Canada. 
when their sarnia plant uh, really polluted, uh, you know, Lake St. Clair, and it was the river and lake guides, the Indians there, the Ojibwe mainly, that uh, had terrible problems. And even Japanese researchers came over and said, look, you have a Minamata disaster here. And the Canadian government did everything they could to say, no, we don't. Uh, we're not going to have any Minamata disease unless we say we have Minamata disease. And so finding the documents to the Canadian problem were very difficult. Uh, but thanks to this couple, the Lambs, <clears throat> who kept every piece of paper that pertained to that um, issue in the late 60s and early 70s, they got all their documents out of Canada and sent them to Harvard, where they lay. So I was able to uh, investigate further the Canadian problem. And this is what led to what's called the first mercury scare, because um, in the United States, around Lake Michigan and other areas, all the way into Alabama, the uh, United States also saw high levels of mercury in lakes and streams from mining, from chemical industries, etc. Uh, one of the problems here is that there's, there's, you know, there's no, nobody's really setting, as we said, there's no safe level of mercury, but there's no standards for exposure. So in terms of appointing blame, uh, you do spend quite a bit of time talking about the failures of the FDA. Not a surprise here, but um, what organizations are supposed to be looking out for us and what has been keeping them from doing it aside from uh, the lovely administrative decisions that uh, George W. made? Well... Uh, and it's not just George W. I found out. I mean, the Clinton administration, right. uh, as I put a chapter in my uh, in Diagnosis Mercury, that uh, he faced some issues, too. But, uh, you know, he was not wanting a lot of warnings because, you know, uh, Don Tyson, who owned Arctic Alaska Fisheries, gave a lot to his campaign. But, um, you know, a lot of politicians find themselves in a bind between their donators and the health of the public. That's not something new. Uh, but, yes... Um, a lot of the pollution had been going on for decades, and uh, it just came to the attention of people. And then what happened then is the uh, guys who were partially funded by fishing industry scrambled to find populations to study to prove to the world that mercury causes no harm. And that's where you get these little studies that took place using fishermen themselves and their spouses that said there's no problem here. And uh, and then you got in the mid seventies this major case where the uh, the guys were partially funded by fishing industry ran over to Iraq to get the data before anybody else did, and then you have Saddam's man uh, Sadun Al Takridi who gave them all the data, and in Diagnosis Mercury I was able to discuss how I got a hold of Dr. Sadun Al Takridi, and he admitted to me, no, I didn't give all the data mm. for political reasons. So not only are we asking people who just got done poisoning their people to give us the data for the investigation, we are using it to set our standards. And that came through the court system, which have failed us. It failed us then. It failed us in Proposition 65 in California. Yeah, explain how that failed us. Yeah, and uh, the hearings, the uh, appeal is taking place today. But the same tactics that were used in the 1970s, saying that, oh, there's no increase of mercury over time, it's all natural, therefore the statute is going to protect us the way it's written, uh, that, um, uh, you know, the fishing industry set the standard as far as what level uh, causes mercury toxicity and what the symptoms of mercury toxicity are. The partially funded fishing industry researchers told us that. And they ignored a lot of the other symptoms that kept cropping up in all these major poisonings. So uh, what happened in Proposition 65 in California, you're supposed to post warnings if there's anything that you're exposing your customer to that causes cancer or reproductive harm. And all California wanted to do was put warnings up, which they got for the major restaurants and grocery stores that sell large predators for fish. But the tuna canneries, the tuna industry, is fighting it. And they say, well, our uh, product doesn't cause a problem. It's too less, uh, um, it's not enough mercury, uh, and therefore we don't need warnings around canned tuna. And they tried every trick in the book, and they got away with it, unfortunately. And um, we need to find a judge that really can understand the science. 
So there's an educational uh, campaign that needs to occur here. And one of the things that's interesting about this is that uh, because the warnings have fallen short, because there are no effective warning systems in place, the only way that people are really finding out about this is sort of social networks, you know, spread of the word of mouth sort of spreads uh, the information. And then, of course, your good work. Um, but people probably still don't know what they should be doing in terms of eating tuna. Do you want to give uh, a quick like one minute synopsis of just on the, on the tuna and then we'll yeah. go back to the other fish how much and and when you should not eat it all well uh here's the the argument is can when you when you have a baby when you're trying to um when you're pregnant the question is will one dose in a critical period of de- development cause harm and most scientists say yes and there's evidence to say that's true the fishing industry says no therefore they try to average um, all the mercury over a month or two time. And they got away with that, doing it even though it doesn't make scientific sense. So what I tell people is you try to avoid the fish that has those big spikes in mercury. And tuna is, the, the large tuna is the, um, a fish that does that. Another one is halibut, especially over 50 pounds. So the little halibut can have low mercury. The bigger halibut can have high mercury. No, but in terms of, if you could, I want to go back to the which fish to choose, but just in terms of tuna, since children oh, okay. are eating tuna, if you could give a quick recommendation sure. in about 30 seconds. So uh, the recommendation is on children, I, you know, the albacore has three times more mercury than chunk light. Chunk light is uh, fairly low in mercury, and uh, still there's lower mercury still if you want to give your child canned wild salmon instead of uh, canned chunk light, you're still going to get much less mercury if you do the salmon instead of the chunk light. Mm-hmm. Um, albacore is one that is argued whether to give to pregnant women uh, and small children. And in Europe, uh, there's some areas that say not to eat albacore for children less than 16. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. Let me just remind people, you're listening to your own health and fitness. I'm Lena Berman with Jeff Fawcett. We're on the phone with Jane M. Hightower. Her book is Diagnosis, Mercury, Money, Politics, and Poison. Her website, again, diagnosismercury.org. And now it's your turn. It's your turn to join us uh, in the midst of this winter fun drive on this beautiful sunny day. Join us and become a member of this radio station and continue this 60-year mission of informing and educating and motivating and mobilizing uh, the consumer and the public to do the right thing. Uh, You can join us during this hour at 510-848-5732 or 1-800-439-5732 and get as a gift for a $100 pledge, which is a little more than our yearly membership is anyway, the book Diagnosis Mercury, Money, Politics, and Poison by Dr. Hightower. Um, Any amount that you pledge during this particular uh, pledge break will be doubled all the way up to $1,200. We have anonymous donors in Sebastopol, in Vallejo, Berkeley, and San Francisco. And right now, I only have one caller on the line, so there's a lot of room for people to call in. Any uh, amount of a pledge will, you know, help us toward this $1,200 match grant. So won't you join the uh, one person on the line right now at 510 848 5732 at the $25 level you become a voting member of KPFA 1-800-439-5732 this book as you've been hearing is really groundbreaking and thank goodness that she did this work but even more than that as usual this is not the shopping network of the air uh, we don't uh, really shouldn't even have to give you a special thank you gift we want to give you a special thank you gift but the gift is 24-7 of KPFA, the original non-commercial progressive radio station that belongs to you. But it belongs to you on the basis of your efforts. Either you volunteer for the station, as Jeff and I do, or you send some money. Right now we have one caller on the line, and we need a lot more than one caller to get up to $1,200 match. We certainly don't want to give the $1,200 back at the end of this hour. Well, actually, this t- t- few minutes, this 20, 15, 20-minute 20 break here. Um, 
You know, the thing to remember here is that this is another example of we've been enlisted by this new administration to get busy and get involved. Jeffrey, you had some ideas on, on that. And I think that one way to do that is to call us now at 510-848-5732, 1-800-439-5732. We do need to hear from more than one of you. Um, and uh, or at kpfa.org where you can join online pledge now uh, to keep this voice alive uh, to keep this administration informed to keep you informed on what to ask for from the administration um, Jeffrey you, you want to comment on that on the new day here and what that means well it's just interesting that today th- today in the context of um, reversing all the Bush administration stuff around uh, Auto uh, auto emission standards and uh, climate change that uh, that Mr. Obama said we are not going to ignore the facts we are going to follow them. Well, this is a big book full of facts, and uh, you would be well informed by getting this by by reading this book and by the other information that's available available to you 24 hours a day on KPFA that keeps you informed, that enables you to be an active citizen, to participate and to do exactly what President Obama has asked you to do, which is make me do it. So let's make him do it. Let's make him control mercury. Let's make him control carbon dioxide. Let's make him do the right thing. And uh, in the context of the of the uh, editorial that I talked about, let's make him focus on prevention, not more drugs and medical devices. Let's talk about cleaning up our environment and preventing illness before we get it. Let's fight very hard for single-payer medical care, but that's not the big issue. The big issue is protecting us so we don't have to use the medical care system. 510-848-5732 is where you call to give us a a chance to enlist you as one of our KPFA family members. 1-800-439-5732 or kpfa.org. We have three callers on the line. We have this wonderful book. Diagnosis Mercury by Jane Hightower for a hundred dollar pledge. You can pledge with a friend and share the book. You can get the book and donate it to the library. What a good idea. Or to a school. Uh, we have a match of twelve hundred dollars, which is difficult to meet if we have a sluggish uh, phone line thing going here. We have volunteers waiting patiently to take your calls. And, you know, I know no matter how you feel about the Obama administration, I know how you feel about KPFA because you've been supporting it for 60 years. Uh, some of you are new listeners. Some of you have been around from the day one. Any small amount that you pledge during this hour is doubled. If you send in $25, if you pledge for that much, uh, we'll give you a T-shirt and the chance to vote in KPFA's elections. Please join the one caller on the line at 510-848-5732, 1-800-439-5732. Our phone lines are wide open right now. We're waiting to hear back from you. Um, again, remember that the ultimate political act, the biggest way that you can donate to help push us out of this economy and push us into a more prosperous uh, situation is with organizations like KPFA, a primarily um, volunteer-based organization people doing what they can to help. We are volunteers at the station. We do the show for free for KPFA. And we come to you three times a year, hoping that you will join our volunteer effort. We volunteer a good t- uh, at least two or three days out of our week to produce and host this show, to find you the guests that matter, the information that's cutting edge that you won't hear, uh, as you know, on, alterna- on, on, on conventional media, but sometimes you won't even hear it on alternative media. And the way that you join us and support us is by giving us a voice by keeping kpfa viable since this is the station that originates this show and disseminates it to you 510-848-5732 this is your station i know that times are tough we will accept any amount of a donation a hundred dollars will get you diagnosis mercury 1-800-439-5732 or on the web at kpfa.org 
This is a hardcover book. It is a brand new book. Uh, Jane Hightower has been doing this research for a long time. She is to be admired and supported for the courage that she had going into the medical establishment with this information, calling the important regulatory agencies and being sort of pushed aside and ignored. She outlines every shred of the information in here. It is very, very alarming information, but it is constructive in the sense that she has found that if people merely adjust their dietary intake of mercury, most of the obstreperous symptoms that they experience go away. Wow. This is after years of people having their amalgams out and going through chelation. What a discovery. She is to be applauded. You can get a copy of this book and read all of the details and how where we are and where we need to go by getting Diagnosis Mercury by calling us at 510-848-5732, 1-800-439-5732. I'm not quite sure what I need to do to get more callers on the line. I know the KPFA audience likes this show. We're one of the most highly listened to shows on the air. We push really hard to find during these pledge drives subjects that will tickle your fancy. But remember that what you're pledging for is 60 years of progressive radio on the air, unprecedented uh, reporting, um, programmers who are not censored in the information that they are allowed to give. Uh, because we, we accept money only from our listeners, we are beholden only to you and strive to make you happy and informed. Please join the one caller on the line at 510-848-5732. Again, it's 1-800-439-5732 or kpfa.org. I'm afraid that we are in danger of losing this $1,200 match grant. We do not have enough callers so far to make this match grant. This would be unprecedented in pledge drive history. Please do pick up the phone now if you were hesitating. Please don't hesitate any further. Call us now. Um, remember, you can share the book with a friend. You can buy this as a gift. You can donate the book, or you can just donate something to KPFA. Please join us at 510-848-5732. Please join the three callers on the line, 1-800-439-4-CALLERS. Fourth, one eight hundred four three nine five seven three two five callers. Thank you so much. Please continue to call. We desperately need to get some callers on the line to make this match grant. This uh, this show, Your Own Health and Fitness, is a weekly show. We have this one shot once a week, three times during the pledge drive to come to you and inspire you and offer you information that goes into your library that is resource for you that you can go back and refer back to in your own health situations. Remember, it is the social network, which is what KPFA is. It is all of us talking to each other that changes this country that makes it possible for things like mercury toxicity in the environment to be reversed. This is the time. The, the issue of change is on the table. We have a president who wants to listen. We need your help now more than ever in order to get the information out to the population so that they can inform the people they have to inform to push this administration to do a better job. Five callers on the line. We need your call right now. We need to make this $1,200 match grant. Please Please, won't you please go to the phone, pick it up, make the call right now, 510-848-5732, 1-800-439-5732, or kpfa.org, fully, fully secure pledging. One of the important messages, uh, lessons in the show that we just did and the book uh, that, uh, that we're offering as a gift today, is, as Lena said, that... Uh, that there's uh, there's something very simple you can do for your health when when you suffer from uh, mercury toxicity. Well, in general, that's really a theme of this of this show, which is very often doing the simplest thing first is is um, is is the best strategy. And contributing to KPFA is a very simple thing that you can do. For some of you, it may not be easy to come up with a hundred dollars, but you can come up. Perhaps you can come up with twenty dollars, twenty five dollars, sixty dollars is our is our standard pledge. But give what you can. It is the simplest thing you can do to also do something simple, which is to stay informed so that you can be active in your community, so that you can care for your own health and the health of those, uh, of those around you, of your people in your community and your families. 
The uh, 510-848-5732. We had a little flurry of phone calls. Let's see if we can get some more of you to get on the line. 1-800-439-5732. We've got this $1,200 match grant, people. That's a lot of money to match. We do need you right now. We can't make it without your help. You who listen in your home, in your car, to this show weekly. You who listen on the podcasts and call me and tell me how much the show has made a difference to you. Those of you who are listening in foreign countries and all over the country, please, won't you go to kpfa.org and pledge now. We have lines open at 510-848-5732, You, you, pick up the phone now. We need your help. We need your support. I know that in times like this, when, when the money is so tight, it's very hard to decide where to put any extra discretionary money. But I would say to you that this would be a better use of your money than buying that one little inexpensive piece of clothing you were thinking of or if you're really at the point where you're not doing any discretionary shopping and but you but you feel you could donate a little something then then i think that the the advantage to using kpfa is that you are covering an enormous range of topics on kpfa if you're interested in the environment if you're interested in health if you're interested in politics it's all here at kpfa and the organizations that are putting forth the information to the public that's changing changing this country it is changing this country this country is in flux it's in change we're in crisis and that is the primary time crisis in health is when people change crisis in a country is when the pol- political body changes we need a little bit of infusion of cash to make the change viable by informing educating and informing something that jane hightower was willing to do at the risk of her reputation something that you can do at the risk of your pocketbook by reaching a little deeper and sending us a small amount of money. Anything from $25 up, $100 shared between two of you will get you the Diagnosis Mercury book. Again, if you have discretionary income, throw us a little extra at this time because we have this $1,200 match on the table. If you have a little more discretionary income and you can push it forward right now, we could really use your help during this fund drive. This is a winter fund drive. This is usually a pretty good fund drive. I know that we're all in financial straits. I know the economy is frightening, but what better use of our energy and our money is our energy than putting forward a little bit toward organizations that that help to drive change, and that's what we're dealing with right now. Please, won't you join the four callers on the line right now, and thank you to the people who are calling in, 510-848-5732. 1-800-439-5732 and kpfa.org. I know that if Jim Bennett was here, he would be deftly explaining why it's so important to help uh, us, uh, those of us who do your own health and fitness as volunteers, to continue to produce this program on a viable radio station. KPFA has uh, good and important equipment uh, available to make it possible for us to produce this show. We um, can't do it without kpfa and kpfa can't do it without you please call us now 510-848-5732 1-800-439-5732 i'm afraid i'm not going to know until the show is over whether or not we made the grant uh the uh, 1200 dollar match i'm i'm i've never seen us not but i do know that we're teetering on the brink because we need a robust number of callers to do that of course actually 12 of you calling so we may have made the match by now i think we've had 12 callers but there is plenty of room right now for any of you to call in we're coming down to the last few minutes of this show um jane hightower's book oh incidentally one of the things that she said in the continuing hour of the show which is on our website um is that she had mentioned that chunk light tuna was okay to eat uh, was she said not okay? She said it was the lowest in 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 uh, mercury. But then she happened to mention as the show went on that one of the tricks that tuna uh, companies are doing is that they're throwing other forms of tuna into the chunk light tuna, um, and so the chunk light tuna in the cans is not actually a safe product because it has other forms of tuna added to it. So. Um, be careful about eating tuna. She, um, in her book, lists all of the uh, types of fish that are lower. She talks about the allowable levels. She talks about how to test. 
Uh, she goes over all of these things. And remember that this is a very groundbreaking piece of research. It was an entirely duh sort of thing, but it was, in fact, groundbreaking for someone to do this. Remember that what she's saying is that in her rather large practice, in her population, she has seen um, these uh, obstreperous chronic disease symptoms reverse by reducing people's exposure to mercury and fish. We are just about out of time here. It's uh, 510-848-5732 or one 800 